Hello and welcome back to the Home Lab and today we're going to look at a really fascinating piece of electronic history. It's a photo frame showing the construction method of Mullard's OC71 transistor from back in the 1950s. As you might know, a viewer of this channel recently got in touch and said his father had some really interesting connections with the electronics business back in the 1960s. And he said, I might have some items that you're interested in. So he sent me a few photographs and in those photographs was an absolute Aladdin's cave of incredible items and some which I've shared with you already. But also there was a photograph of this really interesting frame that shows the construction of the Mullard OC71 transistor. And he said to me, would you like to borrow it? And I said, of course I would. So he kindly boxed it up and sent it to me. And now I've got it on loan. I thought I'd share it with you today. So let's have a look at this amazing artifact that Charlie sent me from his father's incredible collection. Many of you uh, probably remember the OC71, an early transistor from Mullard that was released in 1954. It was designed as a preamplifier in radio and audio applications, and it became very commonly used uh, both in the professional market and also with home constructors the world over. Don't forget, though, that at the time transistors were revolutionary, very small and low power compared with valves, but not at all cheap. So the home constructor would cherish their single example and try not to burn it out with its HFE of around 30 to 70 and its collector current of no more than about 10 milliamps. So let's have a closer look at uh, this construction frame of the OC71. So I'll zoom in a little bit. And do any of you remember the Open University back in the days? I think it was black and white for me on BBC Two. And there was always a chap indicating things very slowly with a pencil. Well, I'm going to do that now. So the first stage in manufacture of this transistor is to produce the germanium. So um, the germanium is sort of grown in a crystal and you'll notice that it's a monocrystalline N type germanium. So a tiny, tiny amount of arsenic was added in the crystal grow to produce N type germanium. Now, before you think, well, that's a bit weird because it's a PNP transistor, you'll see how this works in a minute. You then take a bit of that N-type uh, germanium and it's lapped or um, sliced and smoothed as it were and then etched into tiny little pieces that are going to make up, um, each one is going to make up part of um, the OC71. Uh, so I'll move the camera down a little bit. This is all very Heath Robinson, isn't it? There we go. And uh, to the right of the finished item, you'll see a nickel comb here that's used to hold the construction of the OC71. And then below that, some tiny pellets of indium. And here is the clever bit. The indium, which has a very low melting point, it's about 160 degrees centigrade, was bonded onto the tiny piece of germanium. And when you actually bond the indium onto each side of the tiny piece of N-type germanium, which is held in place by a finger from the nickel comb, the indium actually diffuses into the germanium and that has the effect of making a p-type junction at that point making an alloy junction transistor so below here you can see the actual junctions that have been made and the next stage is to add some leads to this so we can connect it all up so quickly to recap before we capsulate uh, the whole thing once its leads are bonded on. If you remember, we've got our tiny little piece of N-type germanium. So that's the one with the arsenic doping. Then on either side of that, we've got tiny indium pellets um, that are bonded on, but just below about 158 degrees centigrade. So they don't melt, but they diffuse in and create a P-junction on either side. So there's our PNP setup. And that is all joined on to the comb, which is sort of the holder. And that will be the base connection to the transistor. 
So we've got the emitter on one side, the collector on the other with our little Indian pellets and going down off the little bit of end type germanium is the base connection on the comb. So now we've got our little PNP junctions cut out, uh, individual items off the comb up here. We now need some kind of connection to them. So uh, the bit that we always saw, of course, uh, working with these was the external lead in wires. And there's a little glass foot that they uh, fed through. Um, it's interesting that it's glass because I think a lot of the knowledge of construction of these sorts of things uh, must have come from the thermionic valve days. Now, remember, we also need some connecting wires and these connecting wires are the ones that will be inside the package, the ones you won't see, that connect to the PMP junction. Um, above that, we can see a little sub-assembly and they call that sub-assembly one where they connect um, the bit of the comb, in other words, the base connection and then bond on the other two with these little connecting wires. I think they've fallen off, unfortunately, over the years. Um, so. Uh, the comb part, the base, is held in place directly and then the junctions are connected to the lead in or the lead out wires um, via little tiny wires that were bonded onto um, the little Indian pellets. So what we'll look at now is how that was all encapsulated in its little glass bulb. So the final constructions of the OC71 were to create a little glass envelope or little bulb um, that this would all slide into. And um, again, I'm probably thinking back to the days of sort of thermionic construction, that there was a lot of knowledge of how to build electrical components in glass uh, envelopes. So that slid in. But of course, the trouble with these kind of junctions is they're very photosensitive. So um, partly to hold it in place and partly to block off light, we had to do two things. We put in some silicon um, sort of grease um, inside and then passed the whole of this construction into that little um, tube, that little glass tube. Um, and it's quite interesting because I've heard um, or at least read on the Internet quite a few people refer to this as silicon. Uh, be very careful. There's a big difference between silicon here. Uh, well, maybe not yet. Um, this is germanium, but silicon is yet to come and silicon cone which is a sort of rubber. So with the sub-assembly pushed in and into that material um, it's basically manufactured. The problem was of course light getting into this and affecting its behaviour and that's a whole different story which I'll deal with uh, in one of the next videos when I build some circuits with these. Um, but normally it was covered with uh, a black sort of lacquer and I'm told that that lacquer was um, incredibly flammable when it was sprayed on so it was done in a, a, a booth that was sealed and something I read said um, you got 10 seconds to rush out of there if there was a fire uh, because it would flood with CO2 um, and that wouldn't be very good news if you were stuck inside. Uh, but the black lacquer would cover up um, the outside of the transistor so light didn't get in and then after that uh, the bit that we all saw um, the OC71 written on perhaps a date code perhaps a CV code and that red dot that indicated where the collector was and I've been wondering for all these years who was the person who had the job of putting the red dot on or was it done by machine but of course um, once the transistor uh, was manufactured um, these were very very expensive items in the day um, even though they were very, very small compared with thermionic valves, um, they were all tested. Um, so they were kind of individually tested uh, before they were actually sold. So there we go. Um, that's how the OC71 was put together. Just to add a little bit more detail, the observant amongst you will have noticed that the alloy junction construction method used Indian beads on either side of endote germanium. The small bead formed the emitter junction and the large one the collector connection. Further research pointed to the fact that the indium was actually melted so that it would penetrate the very thin germanium wafer. Iron migration was difficult to control and it has been possible to connect the emitter and collector back to front either in a test or a circuit and get the transistor still to work. As for the germanium, some did come from the Congo but it was also extracted from Northumbrian coal burner flu soot and had to be made more than 99.9999999% pure, checked by resistivity measurements. 
I have read many accounts of different dopants being used, but much reference is made to antimony used in a ratio of about one part per hundred million. So perhaps antimony is actually the dopant in the case of the OC71. Whilst the transistor out of its glass case looks pretty simple, the methods used to make it were highly complex and state of the art at the time. So perhaps compare it to the making of modern microchips now. In a video I plan to make fairly shortly, I want to show you the OC71 in action and also working with its sort of brother, the OCP71, which is a phototransistor. And there's lots of stories about those two and whether they're exactly the same or what happened. And I'll tell you those stories when I make that video. But I've got a really interesting circuit to share with you from the period. Uh, some of you might remember it. It was a sort of a magic trick. It was a light bulb um, that you could light with a match and blow out or at least uh, wave at and it would go out. So uh, it was the uh, electronic, um, what do they call it? The um, electronic candle, I think it was called. So I'll be making that video fairly soon. And what we'll do there is we'll actually see um, the OC71 in action. And I'll talk a little bit more about how the transistor worked and how it was packaged. So I do hope you found that interesting and I've been really pleased to share this with you. So my thanks go out to Charlie and especially to his father for managing to collate and keep all these wonderful artefacts. I'll be wrapping this up soon and sending it back to him and then working on that next video with an OC71 in a circuit that's actually working. Um, as you know, at the end of the video, uh, when I finished, uh, do please stay to the end because I often cut in little extra bits that I've not included in the main body of the video. But if you haven't got time for that, put me in your diary anyway, and hopefully I'll be making another video soon and you can join me then.